everybody doing? All right. I want to welcome all of you online joining us whenever you're watching, whether you're wearing pajamas or regular clothes. Thank you for joining us. Um, oh, I got to do one thing real quick. All right, I'll get back to that. All right, so it's Father's Day weekend, people. And I know it's not Sunday, it's Thursday for those of us in here right now, but it is still Father's Day weekend. So could I have all the dads just stand up? Come on, dad, stand up, stand up, stand up. Yeah, give him a hand. And let me just like stay standing for a second. Additional thing, guys, thank you for being here. You know, as dads, like, thank you for being here. It, it matters. So you can, you can be seated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dad. My dad's right over there. Love that guy. All right. So it's, it's Father's Day weekend, and um, I would just say it this way. Like, I think, I think one of the most significant things I've ever done in my life is be a father. I mean, there's, there's nothing compares to that, really. And... Uh, and then being a grandfather is really cool because you can give them back and stuff. But I, and I know that, but it's like, but, but being a father is a significant, significant responsibility. It carries a certain kind of weight with that. And so, uh, yeah, and sometimes we blow it and fall flat on our face, uh, but we get back up. And, and being here just says that you care. Uh, so dads, thank you for being here. That, that matters. Um, Another a very significant thing that I've done with my life, that I've attempted to do with my life, and some of you could say the same thing, is that you have invested uh, a good portion of your life in this valley for the purpose of, of bettering the people of the San Jacinto Valley. So I've been here 36 years. This has been a, a very clear, uh, intentional choice that my wife and I made like when we, over the years, like... Maybe have opportunities to go somewhere else, do something else. It's like, no, this is where God wants us. We want to invest here. And so then as a church, then we've li like literally looked at the opportunities in our community to where we can say, you know, how can we significantly partner with people in our community who are literally getting the job done, right? So we have, for the last several years, partnered with My City Youth Center, we're huge fans of them. Dan and Becky go to our church, the directors there. Um, they do an amazing work with at-risk youth. Uh, we, for, for many years, have been uh, partnering financially and with volunteers and there, and then also Calisinto Ranch. Um, Calisinto Ranch is, uh, they, they kind of grab my heart every time I read about it, because what they do is they provide camps, retreats, and significant things for kids whose parents, one or more, are incarcerated. And so if you've been around our church for all, you know, like every Christmas time, we do kind of like that angel tree thing, and we, we go out and we get gifts for these kids. So even though their parents are in prison, these kids are still getting gifts and lets them know that somebody loves them. And in fact, it literally says it's from the parent. Like, we, we're not taking credit. We just want that kid to know that, you know, God loves them, cares about them. And so they, they know there's more involved than just their parents sending that. But um, it's, it's one of the ways that we get involved, besides like financially uh, supporting them on a, on a monthly basis. Uh, Valley Restart in our community is another big one for us. And it, it's not just because they help people who are struggling get off the street, but they literally help families get off the street. Now, if you notice something clear about all the places that we have chosen to support in our community, and even in other places in the world, there's a lot to do with kids. Because this church was started to help reach young people in this community. That's why this church was started way back in 1981. Started by a group of retired people in order to reach young people. That doesn't work very well, by the way. Uh, but these retired people had a heart for that. And then over time, you know, God continued to mold and shape that vision. So where we were reaching kids, uh, I told you like last week, we had like 180 uh, middle school and high schoolers show up for the big bash. We had over 100 of them come back uh, last night. And so it's just cool to see what God's doing with our middle school and high schoolers. Yeah, that's good. Um, and then our children's ministry has just been blowing up the last couple of months. It's been so cool seeing so many new families come in. Like every week we have multiple families with uh, more kids coming and, and checking us out and watching and seeing what's going on and, uh, and getting plugged in. And so some of you are literally like new this year. You just started coming. So thank you for being here. But I told you last week I was going to let you know that we're, we have a new ministry partner in our community. And again, we care about kids. 
And so this ministry partner, um, they just kind of started back in our community a couple years ago. So the idea was, for a long time, there was a, there was a ministry, the same ministry with a different name that we were supporters of for a long time called Life Choice. And so Life Choice then eventually faded away, finances, whatever, they were out of the community. And then Birth Choice, a little bit larger organization, then replanted the same idea right here in our community. So Birth Choice, if you wanna go to like their website, they have different sites. One of them is in Temecula, one is in Palm Desert, and one is right here in Hemet. And a couple weeks ago, we took uh, some of our key leaders, we went there and we toured the place. I had been there before, and I'm a huge fan of what they do. and I'll explain a little bit what they do in case you don't know. Uh, but we, we took some, some of our leaders there a couple weeks ago and we toured. Uh, the, the director here locally is uh, Liana Westcamp and she gave us the tour. And it was an opportunity for us to, to convey to her, first of all, that we are starting in July, gonna monthly financially support them. And then we wanna discover ways in which we can send volunteers and people who can be a part of that. And um, they're, they're pretty strict on their vetting process, but that, if that's something you're interested in, you can go to their website and check that out and get involved. Uh, it would be awesome if you were. Uh, but we said, we're gonna start supporting you monthly starting in July, like our other local ministry partners. And then we said, um, oh, why don't you just explain more what you do? So one of the things they do, in case you don't know this, like they, they take, it's, it's a pregnancy crisis center but with basically the opposite message as the hugely funded Planned Parenthood. Meaning the opposite message is instead of just aborting and killing children, we're we're trying to show people that God has placed this special gift in them. And so Birth Choice does an amazing job of gently, lovingly walking with people who are confused and afraid. Like sometimes they walk in, they they could be teenagers, they could be in their 40s, that they walk in and they're like, I don't even know if I'm pregnant. And so they help them take a test and uh, they they sit down, they talk with them. But not only do they gently kind of like walk them through the steps of their decision, they're always kind of like pointing them to Jesus in the process. They have ongoing help and counseling and things that, that continue to help them come alongside Jesus and just figure out just how much Jesus loves them and cares for them. Uh, One of the things that uh, Liana shared with us in that tour, she said, um, we have all kinds of people that come in. So sometimes it may be just somebody who's worried and afraid. They don't know if they're pregnant. And if they're pregnant, they don't know if they're going to keep this kid. They just just saw this and they they walked in to see if they could get some help. They have people who have been sex trafficked, uh, prostitutes. Um, They've had cases where... um, the pimp is literally trying to find them in the building, and so they just, they just do a lockdown and trying to help this, this girl. Um, and there, there's a whole bunch more that goes with that, but they're, they're literally helping people like on the very front lines. And we're like, it's one, thing, it's one thing to talk about abortion. It's another thing to say, you know, like, what, what are you doing to help, though? And how are you pointing people towards you know, carrying this child. And, and, and maybe if they want to adopt it out, like how do you connect the dots there, you know? And, and if they want to keep the baby, how do you, how do you help them know how to be a great mom and, and maybe a great dad because the, the dad could be a part of this journey too. And so they have all kinds of resources and help for all that, right? So the cool thing was, we're, we're there and we said, we want to pray with you. And so we surrounded Liana. We're, we're going to lay our hands on her. We're going to pray for her and for this ministry and what they're doing. And we're so excited to be partners. And we said, oh, by the way, we've got a check for you for $18,000 too. And she just was like, floodgates opened up. Because really right now, financially, they can only open two days a week. And so we started praying and then we finished praying. She goes, maybe now we can open three days a week, right? It's like, um, let me tell you why we're able to do that. Because this church is stinking generous. And so throughout the year, we, we map out a budget, which goes from July 1st through the end of June, June. And about this time every year, we're like looking and we say, you know what? We have more money in our budget and in our missions than we, we gave away this last year. We have more than we planned because of the generosity of our church. And so because of that, not only are we going to add a new ministry partner during the year next year, but we were literally able to give them a check for $18,000. And that's because of you. So I wanted to say, this is our new ministry partner, but thank you, community, because you make this kind of stuff happen. So yeah, give yourselves a hand. That's awesome. It's awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. 
Um, yeah, it's Father's Day. Let me go back to this. I felt like this was a good announcement to make on Father's Day. You know what I'm talking about? You can connect the dots there, right? It's like, I think this is cool. That's why I didn't want to share it last week. I wanted to share it this week. Um, but speaking of Father's Day, if you, if you want to boil down like the father's job, the father's duty, the father's responsibility, um, one of the ways I would say it, and maybe you've said it this way before, and I know it entails more than this, but this covers a lot of it. It is this short little phrase, protect and provide. I think, I think as a dad, as a husband, um, that, that's a huge part of what we do as dads, protect and provide. And, and I think for some, for some dads, like they hear provide, and they think that means go get a paycheck and put food on the table. But I will tell you, that, that is part of it, but that's just part of it. And in our culture, like, like moms help provide too. I'm not saying it's not moms, but it's like for a dad's brain, like we understand like protect and provide. And we say, pr provide, I need to leave and I need to go punch a time clock and I need to bring home some food, right? Even though I'm gone like 168 hours a week. <laughs> that's, that's not right. In fact, just about every kid I've ever talked to, if you, if you worded the question correctly, they would answer this way. I would rather my dad make less money and spend more time with me. See, the, the, the totality of providing is not just bringing home a check. The providing includes like providing security and providing love and providing an, an environment, a safe environment where as you're growing up as a kid, you're allowed to fail and learn from it and grow. Like, like providing a, a safety net where your kid never feels consequences, that's not helpful. But providing a safe place where they can fall sometimes and then make their own mistakes and then learn from it and you come alongside them and help them get back up. Like you provide that kind of stuff. You, you, you provide this love, this security. You, pro you provide discipline. Maybe the most powerful thing, dads, the, maybe the most powerful thing that we provide is an example. Now, that can be good or bad, right? <laughs> but we provide an example. It doesn't matter how clearly we articulate the values because they're going to just not listen and they're going to watch. They're, they're going to hear what you do, not hear what you say. Like somebody said, more is caught than taught. And so when we say provide, that's more than just a paycheck. Now, now you understand that. It's like there's a lot to this that we provide, but we also protect. Uh, we talked way back on Mother's Day. I was interviewing Jen, and we were talking about protecting our kids from like just, just the trash, the garbage that's on the internet. And she was talking about how she takes her middle school age boys and they plug their phone in at night and they don't take it to their bedroom. Like you can't have your phone in your room. Like, we're going to just do that in public space, but you plug them in you go to, like, and go to sleep. Don't be sitting there all night going, I can't get any sleep. I wonder why. Like, how many adults are like that, right? A little blue light in your face all night. Like, just put your phone away. But as a dad, part of your job is to protect your family. And so 1 Peter chapter 5 says, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And so part of the job of the dad is to protect his family. And I'm not just talking about, you know, you, this is not like a Second Amendment speech. You've know, you got to be having a gun out by the porch when your, your daughter's first date walks up and you're cleaning your gun. You're saying, you know, I, I don't mind going back to prison. <clears throat> you know, yeah, that's part of protecting her, right? But protecting is bigger than just that. It's bigger than just our muscles or our guns or whatever it is. Like protecting is like there's a spiritual dimension there. So dads, that's, that's another big part of this, protect and provide. But all of this comes under the umbrella of relationship. Relationship. Now, whether you're a dad or a mom or you're single or you're a kid, whatever it is, like we, we understand so much of what the Bible says if we'll see it through the lens of relationship. But one, one more quote. There, there's a business book called Nuts. I don't know if you've ever seen this one. I've never read the thing. I, I actually would be interested in this book. I looked it up and I found it, uh, but I saw somebody else quote it. And uh, this is the quote that they used out of it. You have your whole life to change the world, but you only get one chance to shape your children. Uh, that's not a bad book, in a, not, not a bad quote in a business book. 
And I think nuts, I think it's about Southwest Airlines. But anyway, it's, it's out of that it comes this quote right here. I was like, man, that's, that's good stuff right there. Relationship, relationship. So much of what Jesus talks about in John chapter 14, 15, 16 is about relationship. And we're going to be looking at a big chunk of it this week. So in case you're brand new, we're kind of like working our way through the book of John. Um, we're just doing the second half this summer. We did the first half last summer. And so a couple weeks ago, we were in chapter 12, then chapter 13. This, this week, we're going to go start in 14 and go through about half of 15. And there is tons. You could take weeks just to do these, this, this passage right here. But so much it has to do with relationship. In fact, let, let me give you a, a picture of this. In John 14, I'm going to give you a series of verses. I want you to watch for the highlighted words. Okay, here we go. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. Well, let's try this. Every time we come to the yellow words, you read them out loud with me. I'm going to see if this is a smart audience or not. It's really up to you. I don't know. If you... Oh, yeah, very good. Very good. Okay, well, here we go. If you... Obey my commandments. Here's another verse, just a couple down. Those who accept my commands and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me. my father will. Love them. Yeah, isn't that cool? It keeps going. And I will love them. and reveal myself to each of them. You hear, like, love me, love me, love me, love them, love them, love. It's like back and forth, this whole relationship thing goes. Jesus replied, All who will do what I say. My Father will, and we will come and make our home with each of them. I uh, threw a twist at you, and some of you got it. It's like, love me, love them, and then we're going to make our home with them. This is relationship talk. Maybe you've heard this before. You know, I'm a Christian. That's not a, a religion. That's a relationship. And that's almost a cliche now, but it's based on this. Like, this is how Jesus talks. He's not saying, here's a set of rules, now do them. He said, if you love me, you're going to obey what I have to say. And I'm going to love you. And we're going to, we're going to make this life together. We're going to be in this home, this family together. Like, there's so much of this talk. Now, I'm going to give you a twist in the next, the next verse I'm going to show you. Because I want you to see that Jesus is talking not just about relationship, but he comes from a place of perfect relationship. And in one verse... He mentions Father and Son and Holy Spirit. This, this total unity, this relationship. Relationship's huge to God. Look at this. But when the Father sends the Advocate, which is the Holy Spirit, when, he, when the Father sends the Advocate, some translations, it's Counselor, Encourager, right? But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I, Jesus, have told you. So we've got Jesus... We've got the Holy Spirit, we've got the Father, all in one sentence. Like Jesus is coming from a relationship, and he wants us in relationship. Now, why is that so important? Because God, as Father, this is not a big leap. Are you ready? He wants to protect and what? Provide. He wants to protect and provide. You, you go through the Bible. I'll just, I'll just take a little slice of like the Ten Commandments. Back in the Old Testament and then in the old translation of the King James Version, it was, thou shalt not, right? That's how we learned that for those of you who are old like me. Thou shalt not steal. Like, why would God say that? Well, he's, he's one, he's trying to provide for you. He's trying to protect you. So protect you. He's protecting you from the consequences, for one. It's not just that you could get caught stealing. He's, he's protecting you from a life of greed and materialism which is a dead-end road. He's protecting you from all of that, but then he's also providing you with what it means to be content and, and to find purpose in life. So fast forward, Ephesians chapter 4. There, there's this place where he goes back and forth. This is what you used to do, but now this is how I want you to live. He says, don't steal anymore. So just like the Ten Commandments, he goes, don't steal, but rather work with your hands. Like get a job, so that you have something to share. It's like the exact, instead of taking from somebody, I want you to work and provide for your family, but also then be in a place where you can share. What does that do for somebody? What does that do for your identity? 
What does that do for your self-worth and your value? If instead of just holding your hand out whenever the government gives you a check, like going and getting a job. Now, I know there are people who need help, but there's, a, there's millions of people who don't need help who just continue to take help. And my, my problem with that is it, it destroys their value and their identity. The Bible talks about the value of work. In fact, in the Garden of Eden, think about this, in the Garden of Eden, before sin ever entered, God gave Adam a job. His job was to name the animals. His job was to take care of the garden. He gave him a job. That, the job wasn't the curse, by the way, of sin. The job is what gives us self-worth and value and identity and purpose. And God says, instead of steal, I want to protect you. I want to provide for you. That's just one example. You go, you know, thou shalt not. Thou shalt. What about keep the Sabbath? So I want you to keep the Sabbath. Now, in our culture today, in, in Christianity, we don't hold the Sabbath as the Saturday model as they did in the Old Testament because in the New Testament, we find that the early church began to meet on Sunday instead of Saturday. Like the Jews would meet on Saturday. That would be their Sabbath rest. The, the Christians began to meet on Sunday because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. And so there was a shift there. But, but the principle's still the same. He goes, I don't want you to work seven days a week. What is he protecting us from? Burnout? Stress, family deterioration. Like if all you do is work, you don't have time and, and the bandwidth for actual healthy relationships. He's protecting us. He's providing for us. That's what he's doing. So now I want to go back and I want you to see this because this is what God's doing. God wants to protect and provide in all these ways. And I want to go back to John chapter 14 now. I'm going to go back up to verse 1 and just look at how he opens this. Again, Jesus is about to be arrested. He's trying to protect and provide for his disciples for about what's about to happen. Okay? So that's what's going on. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Why? Because I'm going to provide for you. Because I'm going to protect you. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. By, by the way, this is relationship talk. Did you know that? In John chapter 14, verses 1 to 4, he literally is talking in the terminology of an engaged man. Like in their culture, when you would get betrothed, engaged to somebody, it was like a legal thing for them. They were engaged. And then during that time, he would go back to the home of his father and he would add on to the house. He would prepare this place. He would, he would add on rooms. He would build, or, or he would have his own property. He would build. So while he's engaged, he's building, he's preparing. And then there's going to be a day when they get married. So, so just follow the, the terminology Jesus is using. In the Bible, it says someday Jesus is coming back for the church. They also call the church his bride. Right? So this is all relationship talk. Jesus is saying, this is what's going on. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. When it's ready, I'm going to come get you so we can be together. Right? So that's the picture that he's going to be unveiling in the next couple of chapters here. But what I want to do, because our time is limited and there's so much in this chapter and a half, I want to focus on two phrases that Jesus uses. So with, with that background, he's protecting and serving Protecting and serve. I love that too for all of our law enforcement people. Protect and serve. Protect and provide. And it's all based on relationship. Now, now here are these two phrases Jesus says because I think they carry the right, right kind of weight when we understand what's going on in this whole picture. Here's the first phrase. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So last summer, we looked at several of these. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the door of the sheep. Jesus continues to these kind of phrases to help us understand his divine nature. He is literally claiming to be God. And we talked about this before. It's like he can't just be a good moral teacher and be a liar at the most important part of his message. His message is, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Like, I am God. We're one. And so he's either God or he's a fraud. And here's another one of these statements. I am the way and the truth and the life. Here's the passage. It's in John 14, verse 6. 
Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I want you to see what he connects to this. This is all the same verse. Here's the rest of it. No one can come to the Father except through me. Wow. That's pretty restrictive. That's pretty narrow. There's a whole bunch of people who don't like that. I mean, how, how can Jesus say he's the only way? Really? Like, you know, God is so big. How can there just be one way to God? Like, and people get tripped up right here. And I would just say it this way. When the, when the Bible declares the mission of Jesus, over and over it uses this phrase to describe it. Good news. Now, why is it good news that there's only one way? Here's why it's good news. Because there is a way. God didn't have to provide a way. Like he could have just said, you guys are idiots. You're sinners. You're rebellious. Wipe my hands. I'm done with you. No, but he sent Jesus to give his life's blood to pay the price for our sin. There is a way. This is like amazing good news. But you know what we're, we're used to? We're used to a smorgasbord of options, right? Mom makes the meal, everybody sits down, and Junior says, I don't like that, make me something else. And I'm gonna tell you right now, that kid needs to be kicked across the room, in a loving way, in a loving, <laughs> loving way, right? We're just used to so many options, like this, this ruffles our feathers. What do you, what do you mean? The, oh, no, there is a way. It's good news. And Jesus did all the heavy lifting for us. It's good news. Like he paid the price in our place. It's good news. There is a way. This is awesome. It's good news. Here's the other phrase he uses. We're going to skip over to chapter 15. I just want you to see these two phrases. I am the true vine. I am the true vine. This is the passage where he begins to talk about how God the Father is the gardener, and he prunes us, you know, like he cuts away the stuff that doesn't need our way. I wish we could spend more time on that. We can't. But I just wanted to focus in on this one thing right here. Yes, Jesus is talking. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who, what's it say in yellow? Remain in me, and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Wow. There's, there's so much here, but I'm just going to focus on that word right there. Some of your translations are going to use the word abide, which I admit I kind of like better. Remain doesn't seem to have the depth of relationship as abide, but, but it's, it's a pretty big one. Tony Evans, in the videos that our life groups are watching right now, talks about, talks about this. Some of you are going, All right, did you forget your tea? No, I did not forget my tea. You know what my tea bag has been doing this whole time? Remaining in here. Now, <laughs> this is funny. I, I don't like coffee. Now, when I grow up, I'm going to. That's my plan. I still don't like it. Every now and then I try it. Um, one time I was with a really good friend of mine. We were up in Yosemite. He bought the rights to the name Yosemite Coffee Company. And so while we're in Yosemite doing videos and, and, and I'm taking pictures and stuff, he's literally doing some stuff that he can promote his coffee company. And he makes some coffee in, in Cook's uh, Meadow. And we, we have the view, like there's El Capitan, there's Half Dome, all that. And, and he's making coffee. And I'm like, this is the day I'm going to like coffee. I just know it. And so I videotaped it for my daughters because they know I can't stand coffee. They both like it. And I took a sip and I just went, ah, tastes like coffee. Yeah, so I still don't like it. But I do like tea. Now, people go about tea a couple different ways. You ever seen somebody dip? They're like, dip, 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 dip. By the way, just stop doing that and let it abide. People do that with their spiritual life. I want more of Jesus in my life. I'll go to church on Thursday. Okay, Thursday's over. Next Thursday, let's go back. Okay. Next week, oh, I can't. I got to work late. 
Next week, oh, we're on vacation. Next week, oh, I can't go Thursday. I could go Sunday. And we just dip a little bit of Jesus here and there. Dip, dip, dip. When if we really want to see the difference, we're just going to remain. Excuse me a second. Okay, anyway, hopefully that makes sense to you. It made total sense to me when Tony Evans is like talking. I go, I'm going to show him. I mean, look at everything in here has changed since that bag has been remaining, right? Absolutely. And I want you to think of the difference that could happen in our community, not just because we're praying for our community three times a day, every day for the month of June. I mean, what's the difference that could happen in our community if Christians all around our valley, if Christ followers all around our valley like remained in Jesus, what's the difference that could happen in families if we remained in Jesus? What's the difference that could happen in our schools if our students who are Christians, if our, our teachers who are Christians, if our administration who are Christians, if they would just remain in Christ and then they would walk into those places filled with Christ. What could happen in our, in our workplaces if Christians just remained in him and let him change us and impact us? Like, how does that work? Verse 8 says this, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Now, understand, he said, I'm the vine, and you're the branches, and connected to me, you will bear much fruit. And then he says, when we do produce a lot of fruit, man, this is, this is glory to God. He gets the credit for this. So I want you to think of it this way. When you go to the store, this is the part you buy right here. But I will tell you right now, you can leave that cluster of grapes on your counter for years, and it will never produce more grapes because it's not connected anymore. We, we've got to stay connected. We've got to remain. We've got to abide. That's what he's telling us. All the time. He says, but here's the cool thing, and we already know from another place in the Bible what this fruit that we produce looks like. It's called love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is those things. And he says, when you're connected to me, you're going to be taking love into your workplace. You're going to be taking joy into your workplace. You're going to be taking gentleness and peace into that school. You're going to be taking this faithfulness and the self-control into your neighbor. You're going to be taking this fruit with you because you have remained with me. That's what he's talking about. And that's why this is so important. Again, how? At our church, one of the things we, we talk about pretty regularly is we have four commitments that we made. And we kind of keep these in front of us as a regular reminder, but I'm just going to tell you right now, this one in particular is what we're talking about right now. Every day with Jesus. We're going to remain in him, abide with him every day. So when we say this, like E-P-I-C, it stands for epic, but the E stands for every day with Jesus. And this, this means every day I'm going to spend some time. I want, I want to open his word and listen to him every day. I'm not going to do that for 24 hours. I'm, it may just be a few minutes, but I want, to, I want to, at some point in my day, maybe at the beginning of my day, or maybe at lunchtime, whenever it is, I'm going to spend some time just soaking it up, listening and, and remaining, sitting with him. You know, in Revelation, it says, there's this, there's this cool verse in uh, chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Jesus is standing at the door and he knocks. He's talking about the, the heart of our life. Staying at the door and knocks. And he says, if anybody opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with them. Meaning, I'm going to hang out with them. Like, that's a very personal, intimate thing. And especially in their culture, to, to share a meal with somebody. And he says, if you'll open the door, I'm going to come in. And here's, here's what blows me away. People use that verse in like evangelistic crusades. I mean, if you're not a Christian, just open the door. He's going to come in. That's not who he's talking to in Revelation chapter 3. Did you know that? He's talking to the church. And he says, you're going through the motions, but if you'll open up your heart, I will come in. If you'll let me in, we're going to hang out together. 
And guess who gets changed in that process? I do. If I remain with him, if I hang out with him, if I allow him to just kind of soak into every aspect of my being and my character and my personality, and then he's the one that shows up, that, that's, that's what the goal is. I want him to show up and, and literally flow through my life. I've said it before, I'll say it again. In fact, I know for a fact, 100 years from now, nobody will know me. Nobody. But I could care less in 10 years if anybody knows my name. But if you know Jesus because of me, that's what I care about. And the way that that's gonna happen is not because I say something in a good way, it's because I live my life in a way that if you, you watch me, hopefully you see Jesus. That's what I want to happen. And you don't have to be a pastor to have that happen. In fact, you are in a more powerful position than I am in allowing Christ to shine through you on a daily basis. If I, just think about this. If I walked into where you worked, I said, hey, everybody, listen to me. I'm a pastor. <laughs> like, See ya. Don't want to be ya. Right? You're, you're out, right? But you get, to, you get to work with them day in and day out. You're their neighbor day in and day out. You go to school with them day in and day out. It's like all those kind of places we have these relationships and people get to see Christ in us as long as we remain in him, abide with him. They get to see him in us. One last thing. I'm going to go back to I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's what it says. Now, again, if he really is... God, if he really is who he says he is, then our only response is to follow him. If he's not telling the truth and he's a total fraud, then let's just go do our own thing. Forget about it. But if he is the way, the way to the Father, the way to heaven, if he is the truth, like if he is the absolute truth that never changes, no matter what the culture says this week is popular or right or good or wrong, if he's the truth, if, if he is the way, if he's the way and he's the life, like abundant life, eternal life, wow. You know, when, when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and life, he's responding to Thomas. In verse 4, he says, and you know the way to the place I'm going. And Thomas goes, uh, no, no. I'm paraphrasing a little bit because no, we don't know. Why don't you tell us? And so Jesus' answer is, I am the way and the truth and the life. You, you want to get to God? You want to get to heaven? You want to get to eternal life? I am that way. Like, you just got to follow Jesus. And so I just wanted to bring in our, our mission statement as we wrap this up, just to make you think through this a little bit in case this is all new to you. Like this is what we say our church is all about, helping people step into a relationship with Jesus, build it up and live it out. So let's just say, let's say you're in the beginning point right here and you believe Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. Then you, you begin this relationship with him. And we do that by just saying, God, I'm I'm ready. <laughs> I want you to be in charge of my life. We, we get baptized as this beautiful ceremony that Jesus gave us. This is, this is what I want you to do. We bury the old life. We're raised in a new life. This is stepping in. And then we're, we're building up. And, and this is where we really encourage people to be involved in small groups. We, we give you information and we learn together in this setting. But man, there's nothing like just like rubbing shoulders with 8, 10, 12 other people and like living and growing and doing life together. That's where we really build up the best. And we live this out. When we remain with him, we abide with him, then he, sh he shows up in our life. It wasn't something I said. <laughs> Cute little kid. But let's just go back to it. How could your neighborhood be changed if you abide and remain in Jesus? How is your workplace going to change because you abide, remain in Jesus? Like, that's what it means to live it out, to show people who Jesus is by our life. So what I want to do is I want to pray for dads. But before we do that, I want to pray for all of you right here. For those of you who are ready to step in. Those of you watching online, if you have questions, you can always email us at office at community.cc. You can use your app. Let us know your prayer requests, your decisions, uh, your next step. And again, man, we have this next step uh, dessert coming up. We'd like all of you to come and be a part of that on Wednesday. I think it's the 28th. Um, come be a part of that with us. 
But I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of pray in two parts. I'm gonna pray for those who are ready to step in, and I just wanna pray for dad. So if you would, just bow your head with me for a moment. God, whether um, someone's online or they're right here in this room, and they're like, I, I wanna give my life to Jesus. I wanna start a relationship with Jesus. I believe he is who he said he is, and, and I know I need him. I pray, God, that as they reach to you, they just know beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know them, you know what they've been through, but you absolutely love them and are welcoming them into your family. Help them even just right now, just in their own heart, just say, God, I know I've blown it, and I know I need you. I want to give you my life. And Father, for the dads in the room, for the dads online, we just pray for the heavy, high calling of protecting and providing for, for their family. There's so much that goes into that. But we don't have a better example than you. God, as, as dads, help us just to pursue you and remain in you, learning all the time what genuine relationship looks like so that we can pass that on to our kids, our family. God, work through us so that they can see you clearly in our life. Even in our mistakes, God, may we be humble. May we own it. May we apologize, ask for forgiveness because we do blow it. But all the while pointing them in the direction of you. So thank you for the dads that are here with us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you would like somebody to talk to or need somebody to pray with, make your way up here. Uh, if you want to just go hang out for a while, we've got ice cream outside as usual. Love you guys. See you next time.